nonviolence section. Gandhi as fanatic and totalitarian in the London government's view. While Gandhi has long exercised a notable influence on the left, for much of the time, the liberal West proved quite the reverse of sympathetic towards him. Supreme was the contempt with which Churchill referred to a, quote, fanatic and an ascetic of the Fakir type and well-known in the East, a malevolent fanatic, end quote, engaged in underhand and stubborn fashion in attacking the British Empire and the very foundations of civilization. The habitual imperial arrogance was sometimes charged with racist tones, as emerges in particular from a statement of the 23rd of February, 1931, beginning of long quote. It is alarming and also nauseating to see Mr. Gandhi, a seditious Middle Temple lawyer, now posing as a fakir of a type well known in the East, striding half naked up to the steps of the viceregal palace while he is still organizing and conducting a campaign of civil disobedience, to parlay on equal terms with the representative of the king emperor. Such a spectacle can only increase the unrest in India and the danger to which white people are exposed. End quote. We know that in Gandhi's view, Churchill, quote, only understands the gospel of force. The identical charge was leveled at the former by the latter. Despite appearances to the contrary, the Indian leader was one of those, quote, Orientals, who only understood the language of force. To make concessions meant leading them to think, quote, you are weak or are afraid of them, and if they once think that they have got you at a disadvantage, all their moods become violent, and concessions are treated as valueless. This then made inevitable a succession of repressive measures, without precedent in India since the mutiny, end quote, of 1857, during the Sapoy's Rebellion and the bloody repression that aroused Marx's indignation. Besides, the London government justified itself. Retreat in the face of Gandhi's totalitarian policy was impossible. To be more precise, argued the most exercised representatives of the British ruling class, the Indian leader betrayed a, quote, certain similarity with Hitler, end quote. In this connection, there's a thought-provoking detail. Before being pronounced against Western politicians disposed to indulge or tolerate the Third Reich's expansionism, the condemnation of appeasement, which sealed Churchill's fame, was pronounced against those in Britain inclined to make concessions to the Indian independence movement. To be exact, the first to point a finger at the appeasers of Gandhi was Lord Birkenhead, a friend of Churchill in 1929. The following year, the latter bemoaned the policy of appeasement of the Indian independence movement pursued by certain political circles in his country and did so in conversation with a German diplomat. A few years later, the denunciation would be formulated with the focus on the danger represented by Germany, which had in the meantime fallen under Nazi control. But it remains the case that, quote, Churchill's opposition to appeasement was the logical extension of his fight against Gandhi and the Indian Act, end quote, which hesitantly sought to satisfy the independence movement. From this standpoint, the appeasers were those who, in one way or another, arrived at compromises with an enemy of the British Empire. Even today, Churchillian accents have not entirely vanished. We have seen a successful historian journalist equating Gandhi with Hitler. End of section.